nas la yashkurillah or whosoever does not thank people in effect he does not thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so I'd like to thank my mentor my teacher Shaykh Hussein Yee may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless this man and uh, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala yani giving me the opportunity to live in Malaysia that would be my place because uh, this is where discipline and tarbiyah uh, is to be found in this country you guys are very fortunate and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless the life of this man to give and to serve this part of the world. Ameen. And uh, you know, I cannot be in Malaysia without speaking a bit about Sheikh Husseini. And if you don't mind, just go off topic a bit, if you don't mind. Uh, I found, I found uh, Alhamdulillah, he's not in the audience, right? Is he? Is he there? No, okay. Otherwise, it would be embarrassing, right? Uh, when I, when, I, uh, when I made that transition from music into Islam, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala yani, guided me to certain shaykhs, certain mentors, certain people online that I used to listen to. And Shaykh Husseini was one of, the, of those people. And I could never fathom, could never imagine that one day I would be coming in his center and addressing, addressing his community. So this is, and it feels a bit difficult for me to do. And... But I wanted to say something that happened a couple of years back that makes me, makes me feel speak next to Sheikh Hussein Yee very comfortably than anyone else. And subhanAllah, I have this policy normally in, uh, in my lectures, in my seminars, that I don't want to speak next to any speaker. I don't want any speaker to be in the audience because I'm still a student of knowledge. And these scholars, Dr. Muhammad Salah, Sheikh Asim Al-Hakim, Mufti Ismail Mink, and so on, when I, before Dr. Bilal Phillips, when I sit next to them, I feel like I should be in the audience listening and learning. But Sheikh Hussein Yee, mashallah, is that kind of a scholar who push you to speak. He give you that opportunity to speak and to share your, what you have learned. And this is something I admire in him a lot. And that makes me feel very comfortable. May Allah bless that man. Ameen, Ya Rabbil Alameen. Okay. Uh, back to the topic which uh, was announced as complete your deen and it was truly it was misunderstood by so many people that I'm coming to talk to you about marriage well you're going to be disappointed because <laughs> you did not study the hadith that say complete half of your deen we're going to talk about completing the deen and what do I mean by that I was sitting with one of my mentors one of my sheikhs who you know in the early stages was teaching me and he said to me that Islam was established upon five pillars, right? We know this hadith, one of the early hadith in any books of narrations. Bunya al-Islamu ala khams. Islam was built, yani the literal translation is, Islam was built upon five pillars. Now the question here is, if I wanted to ask you, if I were to ask you that we purchased a house, but this house is only on pillars, will you be able to live in that house? Will you be able to live in that house which only consists of pillars? We need to put some walls, some ceilings, bring in some decorations and so on and so forth, furnitures. Only then the place will be suitable for living. So when we say Islam was established upon five pillars and we know what are these five pillars, the shahada, the salah, the saum, the zakah and the hajj. We know all these pillars, but these are the foundations of Islam, but not the complete house. And this is what many of the Muslims have misunderstood. So the Muslims thought that if I just stick to the five pillars, that's it. That's it. That's sufficient. Yes, there is one hadith where a man came to the Prophet ﷺ and he told him, supposedly I'll pray my five daily prayers, I will fast, I will perform hajj and so on and so forth. Will I be in Jannah? The Prophet ﷺ said, yes. If you're truthful or after he left, he said to the people, if he is truthful, he will be in Jannah. Yes. But the question here, is this only Islam? Are the five pillars that the Prophet ﷺ taught us, are they the only part of Islam? Or we have become a bit selective. So my topic today is addressing the remaining, the building. When I was talking with my sheikh, my mentor, 
who brought to me this idea, he told me once you once your foundations are strong, once your pillars are very strong, then build upon that. Start building. Where is your relationship with your non-Muslim neighbors? Where is your relationship with your parents? Where is your relationship with your friends? Where is your relationship with you know in in, de- in business dealing? Where is where is all of that? All of that is Islam. In fact, the companions of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam they considered every step they take is part of Islam. Every step, every action, it is part of Islam. And came to mind the story of uh, Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu anhu arda, when there was a boy offering him food. Every day he will purchase food for him. And Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu anhu arda, he will ask him about the source of that food. And the boy will explain to him that this is the source. And once Abu Bakr Siddiq verifies that the source is halal, he will eat. And one day he forgot to ask the boy about the source of the food. And he ate one morsel, my brothers and sisters, one morsel only. And after that he remembers. Then he asked the boy from where you got the so- the money to buy the food. And he discovered that the source was unlawful, was haram. And all of a sudden Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu anhu arda stood up and he dipped his finger into his throat and he vomited that morsel, that little morsel. Although even if he ate it, unknowingly that the source was haram, it would have not been a problem because he didn't know. But he cared too much. And when the companions complained, they say, why did you do that to yourself? He say, the belly or the stomach of Abu Bakr will never taste something haram. This is how the companions lived their lives, that every step they have taken, it was part of Islam. Unfortunately, nowadays we have made this separation. We have made a separation. When I'm at work, this is not Islam. So I could use Facebook, no problem. Yeah? If I ask you by a show of hand, how many people view Facebook, Twitter, YouTube videos during working hours, there will be some embarrassment. There will be some embarrassment. And some people laughing already, I know you already. <laughs> yeah? And, and the people will, will, will not even ask, is it halal or haram? It becomes the norm. It becomes the norm. Haram becomes the norm, unfortunately. I was shocked yesterday when someone approached me, a sister, and she asked me, is dinner really haram? Why it is haram? Give me a reason, convincing reason. Why? Why she's asking that? When I went home and I started reflecting, why she's asking such a question? Because it becomes the norm. Boyfriend, girlfriend is all overspread. The movies, the type of films that we're watching, spreading these ideas. So the scholars say, beware of ill fil ma'asiya. Beware. Beware of the sins that becomes the norm of the society. You become desensitized. You become, you know, that would be the norm. You will not even bother that this is haram. You will not even think about it. Why? Because from all directions, the haram is being promoted. So the topic today is bringing few elements of these forgotten manners, forgotten ethics, forgotten part of Islam that if we practice them properly, each of them, as we will see now, each of them, my brothers and sisters, its reward is Jannah. Each of them. And if the reward of such action is Jannah, if the reward of such action is Jannah, then the question that we should ask ourselves now, are these things important or not? Are these things part of Islam or not? Yes? What is the first on the list? One of the things that are forgotten. And by the way, everyone in the room knows what is halal and what is haram. Everyone knows. When I was into music and I was trying to make that transition, I wanted to have it both. I wanted to pray. I wanted to love Allah. I wanted to love the Prophet I wanted the Quran. But I also wanted music. I also wanted songs. I also wanted movies. So I used to ask every sheikh, every bearded man, even priests with beard. Why? Because I'm waiting for one person to tell me, 
yes, Sun Music is okay. I was just waiting for that person. I was trying to ask as many people as possible. Why? Because I'm looking for my own desire. I'm, I'm running after my own desire. We just read, while, while we were eating, a brother showed me a message from one, one of the mashayikh. He said, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in the Quran, فَاسْتَقِمْ كَمَا أُمِرْتْ Be steadfast, be firm upon your belief as you have been commanded. Not as you have, not as you wish, not as you desire, not as you want. No, no, no. Be firm as you have been commanded by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Islam is a religion, my brothers and sisters, to be practiced according to Allah's decisions, not according to your own wish and desire. The companions of the Prophet ﷺ, whenever he gave an instruction, they never have that sickness of why. They never asked him, they never argued with him. So what is that first thing that we need to revive in our, you know, in our life? And you may be surprised and you may say, this is silly brother, we know that this is halal, we know that you know, the opposite is haram. What is it? Anyone can tell me? What is it? Anyone can guess? Something very encouraged, something very important, essential for a Muslim character. Without it, you can never call yourself a complete Muslim. And its opposite, or its opposite can classify you as a hypocrite. What is it? <sighs> Let me drink some water. Huh? What is it? Very important. Someone say Salah, right? Anyone, can, anyone else can guess something else? Jazakallahu khayran. Being truthful. Truthfulness and honesty. An essential part of Islam. You see the brother, naturally, we always think of acts of worship. Naturally. Because that is what we have been taught that Pray, pay zakah, fast Ramadan, and so on and so forth. The, emph the emphasis was always on acts of worship, which is important. I'm not trying to belittle of the acts of worship. What, what I'm trying to say is that acts of worship, as they are very important in Islam, there are certain other things which are equally important. Equally important, very important. That's why in many of the ayat, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about, for example, قَدْ أَفْلَحَ الْمُؤْمِنُونَ الَّذِينَ هُمْ فِي صَلَاتِهِمْ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said successful are those believers. And then he gave the characteristics of those, the belie those believers. Number one, what? Fi salatihim those who pray with concentration, with focus. Not, not during the salah they are thinking of titere and samosa and all that. Yeah? They are focusing on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the words. And the next ayah, وَالَّذِينَ هُمْ عَنِ اللَّغْوِ مُعْرِدُونَ And those who stay away from vain talk. One act of worship followed by one ethic, one manner. Can you imagine now? Can you see the value? So acts of worship goes hand, hand in hand with banners and dealings. They are equally important. And the most important, one of the most important of all manners is being truthful. And truthfulness is, here can be physical truthfulness and spiritual truthfulness. The spiritual is related to your intention. Why are you praying? Why are you here? Why did you come here today? Did you come here to learn something about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so that you can implement it in your daily life? Or you came here to see that Egyptian guy with a big nose? <laughs> it's up to you. And if that was your intention, the second one, then you, alhamdulillah, Islam gave us that opportunity to flip our intention, to change it and to renew it. And sit the remaining time, inshallah, for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, not for the sake of anyone. Ameen. Truthfulness and honesty. Listen to what your beloved Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and my beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said about this. He said what? Alaykum bis sidq fa inna sidqa yahdi ila al-birr wa inna al-birra yahdi ila al-jannah. وَمَا يَزَالُ الرَّجُلُ يَصْدُقُ وَيَتَحَرَّ الصِّدْقَ حَتَّى يُكْتَبُ عِنْدَ اللَّهِ صِدِّقَ The first part of the hadith, the Prophet sallallahu is saying what? I command you to be truthful. It's a commandment, there is no choice. I command you to be truthful. Why? Because truthfulness leads to righteousness and righteousness leads to Jannah. Who doesn't want to, to go to Jannah here? Raise up your hand. 
Everyone wants to go to Jannah, alhamdulillah. So here is a key from the keys of Jannah, to be truthful. And then the Prophet ﷺ continued by saying, and a man or a woman for that matter, keep on telling the truth. It becomes a habit to say the truth and strive, no matter what happened, I'm not gonna lie. Strive to say the truth until they are written with Allah as truthful. You will be coming resurrected on the day of judgment with a label, truthful, Allahu Akbar. Siddiqa, the word was used, Siddiqa. Abu Bakr al-Siddiq, radiallahu anhu arda, that was his title because he used to believe in the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa and he never uttered a lie. Would you want to be resurrected with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa in Jannah? Would you want to be with them, the companions and the Prophets? Would you want to be with them next to them in Jannah? If you want to be with them in Jannah, be like them in dunya. Be like them today. That, that's the criteria. Jannah is not cheap. Jannah is not cheap. Indeed, there is a commodity, there is a product, which is with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and that product is very expensive, the Prophet said. Ala inna silat Allahi ghaliya. Indeed, the, the commodity of Allah is so precious, is so expensive. Indeed, the commodity of Allah is Jannah. So you will not attain Jannah by just sitting saying, my name is Fatima, Aisha, Khadija, Muhammad, Mustafa, Omar, I'm born in Pakistan, I'm born in Egypt, in Saudi, in Malaysia. No, Jannah is not to be given by race. Jannah is to be given by the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and by your work. By your work, work hard towards it. The second part of the hadith, the Prophet said, وَإِيَّاكُمْ وَالْكَذِبْ I warn you from lying. I warn you from lying. Why? Because lying leads to wickedness. And wickedness leads to hellfire. You remember when we were young, our parents used to tell us, if you lie, you go where? You remember this? Malaysians don't say that. <laughs> if you lie, you go to hell. That's what our parents used to tell us when we were little. And we used to scare when we lie. We, we used to scare the, my father and my mother used to say, you will go to hell if you lied. The Prophet ﷺ is emphasizing this fact. That lying will make you a wicked person and your wickedness will lead you to hellfire. And a man keep on telling lies, you know, it becomes like a chewing gum. It becomes like a habit. And strive to tell lies until he is written with Allah as liar. May Allah save us. May Allah save us. And that's why when the Prophet, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose his prophets, that was the criteria. That was the quality. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in the Quran, وَذْكُرْ فِي الْكِتَابِ إِبْرَاهِيمَ إِنَّهُ كَانَ صُدِّيقًا نَبِيًّا And mentioned in the book, relate in the book the story of Ibrahim alayhi salam. Indeed, he was truthful. He was a prophet. When he mentioned the Prophet Idris, he said the same thing word for word. وَاذْكُرْ فِي الْكِتَابِ إِدْرِيسَ إِنَّهُ كَانَ صُدِّيقًا نَبِيًّا The same thing. I mentioned in the book the story of Idris. Indeed, he was a truthful and he was a prophet. And when, the pro when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned Ismail alayhi salam, the son of Ibrahim alayhi salam, he said what? وَاذْكُرْ فِي الْكِتَابِ وَاذْكُرْ فِي الْكِتَابِ إِسْمَعِيلَ إِنَّهُ كَانَ صَادِقَ الْوَعْدِ إِنَّهُ كَانَ صَادِقَ الْوَعْدِ وَكَانَ رَسُولَ النَّبِيَّ And mention in the book the story of Ismail, indeed, he was truthful to his promise. Promises, my brothers and sisters. Mobile sometimes make you liar, right? I'm coming, five minutes. The longest five minutes in the world can be happened only over the phone. Be truthful to your promise. And look, because Ibrahim alayhi salam was, was truthful, he taught his son to be truthful. And as a result, both of them are mentioned in the Quran as truthful. Sometimes parents, they lie. They lie to their children. And their children, they catch them in the lie. And sometimes we ask our children to lie on our behalf. Yeah, the phone will ring and the son will answer. And the father from far, if Uncle Omar told him, I'm not here. I'm not here. Yeah, 
It happens or no. And then when they lie to you, you blame them. You beat them. You shout at them. From where they got the idea of lying? You are lying to them. You are making them lie on your behalf. And the Prophet ﷺ, his title, his title by his enemies, given by his enemies, As-Sadiq Al-Ameen, the truthful, the honest. We need to revive that. We need to be truthful. Some people will come and come up with these ideas of white lie. And, you know, how many of you here believe in white lies? Raise up your hand. Yani, be honest. Be honest. Anyone, yani, if you heard me uh, asking this question before, it's okay, bear with me. But I wanted to know how many of you here believe in white lies? Anyone? Be honest. Yani, don't, don't be scared. We have few hands. Okay, who doesn't know? Who doesn't know white lie? Is okay or not? Raise up your hand. Okay, who knows that white lies it's haram? Everybody, nobody also, subhanAllah. <laughs> there are some Muslims today, as we can see, they raise up their hand, they believe that there is something called white lie. And of course, there are some people, if you don't like white, we'll have purple lies, pink lies, whatever. we'll make it colorful. You see, they call lies with a, a good term, white symbol of purity can you imagine the prophet ﷺ, this is one of the predictions of the, of the prophet ﷺ. he even said that alcohol intoxicants will be named differently to mean something okay acceptable so instead of saying i'm going to drink alcohol <laughs> nobody talk like that you say what i'm gonna have a drink i'm gonna have a drink it's simple drink water drink anything drink and they call it what? Spirit. <laughs> Have you seen that? They call it spirit. Spiritual drinks. <laughs> so my brothers and sisters, there is no pink line, there is no white line, there is no black line. Lies are lies. Lies is uttering wrong information to mislead others. Or to get rid of your problems. If you have done something wrong, you want to get rid of your problems. So you will lie, you will say wrong information. Lies are acceptable only in three cases we said before. If you are under threat, if you are reconciling between two people who are quarreling, or anyone knows the third? Huh? To your, to your spouse. To your spouse. You look at her and tell her, you are the most beautiful woman ever, you know? And Sheikh Hussein told me before, uh, after the lecture, also I mentioned that example here, I remember. I remember just now. He said, but don't exaggerate too much. <laughs> Otherwise, she will call you a big liar. You know? <laughs> what is the opposite now? What is the opposite of truthfulness? Lying, deceit, hypocrisy. The Prophet Muhammad wasallam said, Ayat al-Munafiq Thalat. If you wanted to identify a hypocrite, look for three signs. What is the first on the list? Either haddatha kadab. When he speak, he utter lies. When he speak, he utter lies. The first on the list. May Allah save us all. May Allah save us all. That's why the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make him firm upon that deen. Allahumma inni as'aluka al-thabata fil-amr. And in another dua, he say, Allahumma inni as'aluka lisanan sadiqa. Oh Allah, I ask you to grant me a truthful tongue. Imagine who is making that dua, the Prophet, the best of all. The one who is declared in the Quran as the one who stands on the top of all moral characters. وَإِنَّكَ لَعَلَى خُلُقٍ عَظِيمٍ That same person didn't sit down, relax and relied on that. He's still making dua. He's still asking Allah to grant him a truthful tongue. So this is your homework, inshallah. Those who knows me, I give homework. Yes. So the dua that the Prophet ﷺ mentioned, Allahumma inni as'aluka lisanan sadiqa. This is part of a longer dua. Go and search on the internet about this dua. Oh Allah, I ask you to grant me a truthful tongue. Get that dua, print it out, memorize it, say it every day. Because we need to fix our manners. A well-mannered person without worship, yani you cannot worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala unless you have the right manners. And you cannot have the right manners without acknowledging the Creator. You cannot. 
You have to go hand in hand. Look at the lady who used to pray and fast and give charity. They came to the Prophet Sallallahu telling them, telling him that this lady is known for her prayers and charity and so on, but she harms her neighbor with her tongue. The Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, لا خير فيها هي في النار. There is no goodness in such a lady. She is in hellfire with all her prayers and worship and so on. We have to be very, very careful. So how to be truthful? How to develop the act of truthfulness? We will have one tip for now, inshallah, so that we can move on and cover other points, inshallah. If you wanted to be truthful, stick. Can you see the word? Stick to those who are truthful. Stick to those who are righteous. Stick to the correct congregation, correct jama'ah. Stick to them. Because the Prophet said, A person will always follow and will be inclined to follow the religion or the way of life of his friend. So be careful who your friends are. If your friends are engaging in idle talk, in lies, in backbiting, in gossiping, in all these diseases that we discussed in this place before, then you will follow. Naturally, you will follow. What is the solution? If somebody come back biting your sister or your brother, stop them. Simple. Will you fear the people and not, not fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Because some people say that if I stop the person who backbites, he will get angry or she will get angry. How about Allah? How about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? We need to develop this. So the, the solution to be truthful is to be with those who are truthful. And this is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in the Quran. Ya ayyuhal ladheena manu attaqullaha wa koonu maa sadiqeen. All you who believe. All you who believe Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is calling you and I. O oh, believers, listen to this well. Ittaqullah, fear Allah. Be conscious of Allah and associate yourself. Be with those who are truthful. This is the solution. If you want to be truthful, stick with those who are truthful and stay away from those who are liars. Then you will develop that truthfulness nature, nature inshallah. And as a result, it will become one of, the, of your habits which will lead you to Jannah inshallah. Can you see the importance of these manners now? Now when we start practicing this, what we are doing actually we are building. We are completing the deen. We are completing the faith. We are not only stuck with the pillars. I know people of 70, 80 years who doesn't know anything about Islam except the five pillars. They are still asking about wudu. They need a fiqh of bathrooms. You know, fiqh of bathrooms. How to deal with, you know, things in the bathrooms. All their lives in the bathroom. Wudu, najasa, istinja, all these, all these questions, all their lives. When are we going to grow? When are we going to ask about something bigger and bigger? When are we going to decorate the house? When are we going to beautify the house? Yeah? So this is one of the things that can beautify your character and build up your Islam. The second part is very important also is uh, ar-rifq or gentleness. Gentleness in dealing with one another, in overlooking each other's mistakes. Unfortunately, we have become so harsh on each other. And if your hands is here, or here, or here, or if you put your hands up here, or if you put it down there, we, started, we start labeling one another with titles. Yeah? And you know what are the, these titles, yeah? You know. Or shall I repeat it? Because we are live now. <laughs> we start labeling each other just because these little differences. If you go back and see how the Prophet wasallam was so merciful to an extent that sometimes he will actually relax the rules of Sharia. He will relax it. He will not go with it. Here is a story, Amr ibn al-As radiallahu anhu arda in one of the ghazwa, one of the battles called Dhatu salasil It was freezing, it was very cold and he woke up during Fajr to pray and he was having a wet dream. He had a wet dream, and wet dream according to the Sharia requires what? Requires a complete shower, a complete ghusl. But he couldn't because it was too cold. So what did he do? He didn't even make wudu. He made tayammum, dried ablution. Not only that, he led the Muslims in salah, the companions. 
And after that, he told them the story. And then when, we, when they went back to the Prophet ﷺ in Medina, he explained to him what happened. And the Prophet ﷺ told him, Did you let the Muslims in Salah while you have wet dream? Without having ghusl? He said, Yes, Ya Rasulullah. And then he quoted one ayah. He said, Allah said, لا تقتلوا أنفسكم إن الله كان بكم رحيما Do not kill yourself. Allah is upon you, is a merciful. So the Prophet ﷺ, look at this. The Prophet ﷺ didn't tell him, Haram! He didn't tell him, no, go now and shower and make you salah now in a, in a boiling water, not in a cold water, in a boiling water. He did not do that. He laughed, the narrator said, he laughed and he said no words. Meaning what? We know according to you know, the study of the hadith and the sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that whatever the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam became silent ap- about, it is an indication of his approval. But that doesn't mean that it, it is a, a general rule now, that everybody have wet dream, okay, it's cold, let's, you know, no, 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 don't be smart. It means that for that particular situation, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he was with us, he was alive, he had the authority to relax the sharia. But look how merciful he was and how gentle he was in dealing with such differences. If this happened today, what will happen? The man who urinated in the masjid, in his masjid, and the companions rushed towards him. He told them what? Leave him to finish. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. If this happened today in Malaysia, what will happen? If somebody entered our room now, and he went in the corner and he started urinating. What will happen? How many men will run after him? Maybe the next day will be janazah for this man. <laughs> the Prophet ﷺ, the merciful, he was a merciful. We have not sent you, O Muhammad, except as a mercy to mankind. He said, Leave him to finish first. After he finished, go and clean what he did. Allahu Akbar. And while they're cleaning, he talked to the man in the corner, advising him that this is not the place for doing such a thing. The man who came to the Prophet ﷺ asking him, allow me to commit adultery. Allow, give me a permission to commit zina. What will happen if someone said the same thing today? That's why we need to bridge gaps between educators, sheikhs, imams, and the lay persons and the youth and the youngsters. Open your heart, receive these questions not with a sarcastic remarks or a, a bad, harsh look. Accept it. Accept these, you know, little things. It's not little things, but accept it from the people, from the youngsters, so that you can educate them and teach them properly. The Prophet ﷺ immediately realized that this man is infected with the love of a woman or with the love of women. Haram relationships. He told him, do you accept this to happen to your mother? He said, no. To your sister, no. To this, to that amongst your family members, he said, no. See, other people too don't like this to happen to their mothers, to their sisters, and so on. He reasoned with the man. Mildness, you know, soft approach was one of the qualities of the Prophet ﷺ. And again, I told you, every manner I will discuss today, the reward of it, if you practiced it regularly, is Jannah. The Prophet ﷺ in one of the hadith, he said, أَلَا أُخْبِرُكُمْ بِمَنْ يَحْرُمْ عَلَى النَّارِ Shall I inform you about someone which hellfire is haram for him? Hellfire is forbidden for such a person. Who is that person? تَحْرُمْ عَلَيْهِ, uh, تحرم عليه النار على كل قريب هين سه. Hellfire is haram ab- uh, upon anyone who is so accessible, so easy, and so mild. And so gentle. Haram, hellfire becomes haram for such a person. Tahrum ala kulli qareebin hayyinin sahl. It is haram upon anyone who's kind, accessible, easy to deal with, and gentle in approach. And we are lear- we have learned the story of Musa alayhi salam, Harun alayhi salam, and Fir'aun. We heard this that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent them both. How many of you here are engaged in da'wah? Anyone here engaged in da'wah? Doing da'wah, propagation, talking to people about Islam? Don't be shy, yani. come on. Yani, I can see already the volunteers don't, none of the volunteers raise up their hands, subhanAllah. Okay, pass, pass. 
those who are involved in da'wah. And when I say da'wah here, it means that if you are trying to teach anyone anything about Islam, that's da'wah. To the best of your knowledge, to the best of your ability. Listen to this story. You will never be better than the prophets, right? Will you, will you attain the status of the Prophet ﷺ? Will you attain the status of Musa, Harun? No, you will never be better than them. And you will never give da'wah to anyone worse than Fir'aun. Never. You will meet so many bad people in your life, but not as bad as Pharaoh. Yet, the Prophet ﷺ, Allah subhanahu wa said in the Qur'an, اِذْهَبَا إِلَىٰ فِرَعُونَ إِنَّهُ طَغَىٰ فَقُولَا لَهُ قَوْلًا لَيِّنًا لَعَلَّهُ يَتَذَكَّرْ أَوْ يَخْشَىٰ Go, both of you, to Fir'aun. Indeed, he has transgressed all limits. But say to him mild words. Allah. Say to him nice words. Maybe, perhaps, he will be reminded and fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is a command given to the prophets to, to deal with the worst of all people at that time, Fir'aun, with mildness and gentleness. How about us Muslims towards one another? We, we have reached to a, a point that we, we don't want to pray next to each other because, you know, my socks is not the same color as yours. Little differences makes a big, big, you know, div division among the community. That's why I wanted to urge you, my brothers and sisters, those who are here. Wallahi, I was telling to the brothers, I think some of the brothers with me here, so, so this is not like a setup or something. I was telling this even before coming to the lecture, before meeting Sheikh Hussein. This is one of the places that I have experienced the best prayer in my life. Wallahi, the best prayer in my life. The brothers here are following Shaykh Hussein, mashallah, and he, how he teach the people to pray to an extent that uh, we, we invited Shaykh Hussein to Hong Kong to give the same, the same course. And then I came here experiencing the real, you know, in action. And the brother next to me, oh, his feet was almost on the top of my feet. <laughs> They follow. They, 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 there is there is a practicality. There is there is there is. A <laughs> well, I enjoyed it. I loved it. I was happy because I can see the teaching, the theory is now in action. Because the non-Muslims are abusing us, are accusing us that your book says a lot of beautiful things, but in action you're different. And they are right. Let us be honest. Because we have become people of intentions. My intention is good. My intention. I want to quit smoking. <laughs> Pray for me. Pray Allah guide me. You're smoking. You're still smoking. <laughs> we, we have become people of intention, wishing, desires. We don't execute. We don't act. We need to change our attitude. Uh, the brother, Wallahi, brother Elias was talking to me in the car and he hit me by saying something like, anyway, we're going to live like 60, 70 years and that's it. He reminded, he reminded me how short my life become. You know. But it's right. It's, it's, if, you, if you just made, do the math now, how many years are remaining in our lives? Guys, how many years are we going to live on earth? So we better correct the remaining instead of losing them and losing the hereafter as well. And here are actions that the Prophet ﷺ is giving us and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is teaching us that as a result we would be entering Jannah inshaAllah. Even in speech, Allah said, وَقُولُوا لِلنَّاسِ حُسْنَا And tell people nice words. Tell them good words. Make them happy by telling them, الْكَلِمَ الطَّيِّبَ sadaqa. Good word is sadaqa. This is what our Prophet taught us. But we have focused only on acts of worship, which I'm saying again, I'm not belittling of the actions of worship. What I'm saying is that we have neglected other things in Islam, which are equally, equally important. The Prophet ﷺ told Aisha radiallahu anha wa Ya Aisha, inna Allah rafiqun yuhibbu rifqa Oh Aisha, Allah is so gentle and he loves gentleness. I was telling my story yesterday and I said it many times before about how my wife used to invite me to the church. So my wife was a Catholic, for those who didn't know from the Philippines, and when we moved to Hong Kong, she used to invite me to her church every Sunday. And because I love her, I just used to follow her. Even though I did not accept the fact that I'm staying in a church and standing and sitting and, you know, uh, doing the Holy Communion and so on and so forth, 
But every time she will ask me to go with her to the church, I will go. Why? Because I love her. And I'm not trying to send her a message uh, via live uh, chat yet. But the point I'm trying to make is that if you love Allah, what you should do? If you love the Prophet ﷺ, what you should do? If Allah loves something, if your husband loves something, you're going to cook for him. You're going to cook for him that which he loves. Allah loves gentleness, you should be gentle. You should be mild in approach. You should deal with differences with wisdom. We have experienced a situation in, uh, during the, the, the straight path from those who are religious, those with beards. But the reaction shows that I'm not going to listen even to you again. If you are religious and teaching religion, but you behave behind the scene in that way, no, how can I get religion from you? We have to behave. As much as we are teaching, as much as we are worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to the best of our ability, we have to perfect our manners. إِنَّمَا بُعِثْتُ لِأُتَمِّمَ مَكَارِمَ الْأَخْلَاقِ I have been sent only, the hadith says like that, Inama, I have not been sent except to perfect manners. Who said that? The Prophet ﷺ. So I hope and I pray, I'm, I'm sweating because I feel like, you know, this is very urgent, very important moment to, 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 to stand and to sit, you know, reflect over what I'm, I've been saying so that we can, you know, inshallah, die upon the right path. Die upon the right path. يَوْمَ لَا يَنْفَعُ مَالٌ وَلَا بَنُونَ إِلَّا مَنْ أَتَى اللَّهَ بِقَلْبٍ سَلِيمٌ On that day, nothing will help you in the least. Nothing. Your children, your wealth, your money. Nothing will help you except those who go back to Allah with pure, sincere, and sound heart. That's the criteria. Uh, the Prophet ﷺ said, مَا سَبَقَكُمْ أَبَا بَكْرٍ بِكَثْرَةِ صَلَاةٍ وَصِيَامٍ Abu Bakr Siddiq, the best of mankind after the Prophets, he did not supersede you. He did not become more, you know, in, in, stat, in status better than you because of his salah or siyam. No, he supersedes you by something it occurred deeply in his heart. That was his secret. His level of iman was different. His level of yaqeen was different. That's what makes Abu Bakr superior. Not by his salah, because salah is a relationship between a person on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But manners is a relationship not only between you and Allah, but between you and the people as well. The third point that I wanted to talk about is something also related to the previous one, but it's about the love for the sake of Allah. The love, loving each other sincerely, genuinely, for the sake of Allah. Because in general cases, why will I call you? Why will I call Ilyas? Assalamu alaikum brother, yes, how are you? Alhamdulillah. How's your father? Alhamdulillah. How's your mother? Alhamdulillah. How's your sister? She got married. How's this? How's that? How's this? How's that? By the way, can you please come to my house? I need a ride, please. Can you, can you drop me to, to my, if you don't mind? So I was not calling to ask about Ilyas or his mother or his father or anyone. I was calling because I wanted the ride. But I made that introduction, false introduction. I'm not calling to ask really about Ilyas. I don't care about him. I care about his car. Reflect over this. And the next time when you call someone, if you need him, remember you will start to say, how are you? And how's everybody? Are you okay? Are you good? Good? Okay. Uh, can, I, can you lend me money please? I need money. There is a man, we are told, who traveled from one city to another. Why? Just to visit his friend. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent an angel in a, in a human form asking him, why are you going to visit your friend? He said, because I love him for the sake of Allah. For no reason. I'm just going visiting him for the sake of Allah. So the angel responded by saying, because of your love for your friend, Allah sent me to tell you, he loves you. And once Allah loves you, that's it. Congratulations. Welcome to the winning team. The Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa said that on the day of judgment, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will be calling in the crowd, Aina al mutahabuna bi jalali. Where are those who loved each other for my glory, for the sake of my glory? Where are they? Allah will be looking for those people who genuinely love each other for Allah's sake. Al-yawm, this day, 
the hottest day where the sun will come near by our head by one mile. On that very difficult day, Allah will say, al yawm I will shelter them this day under my shade where there will be no shade except my shade. On the day of judgment, people will be seated. Those who love each other for the sake of Allah will be seated on pulpits, on pillars of light. Pillars made of light to an extent that the murderers and the prophets will envy them. That's the reward of those who love each other for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we know that there is one hadith where the Prophet ﷺ told us, seven group will be shaded under Allah's shelter on the day of judgment. One of them is what? Two people who love each other for the sake of Allah. They meet upon that and they depart upon that. No any other worldly needs. We don't meet just for, you know, benefits, worldly benefits. No, we meet genuinely because we care about one another. We meet, maybe we call each other, not only because I want to borrow money or I want the ride. I'm calling you to wake you up for Fajr. Maybe I'm calling you to wake up for Fajr, the one that you have been struggling about for many years and still struggling. Fine, that's why I said without jama'ah, without company, without the righteous friends, we are not going to be good Muslims. I'm telling you bluntly. The Umar ibn Khattab said, Alaykum bil jama'ah. Stick to the congregation. Stick to unity. Once you practice Islam on your own, yani, inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raja'un. Shaitan will be with you all the time. But when you are together, togetherness, that, that, that fact alone, that's why when we pray, even if you are alone, do you say, ihdini sirat al mustaqim or do you say, Ihdina, Ihdina Sirat al Mustaqim? Guide us, even if you are alone praying. That fact alone can improve your Iman, can increase your Iman. The last part that I wanted to mention, inshallah, but before that, yani, uh, inshallah, after the lecture, I wanted to see one thing to happen in this masjid. After you know, we, we turn off the cameras and all, I want the brothers to stand up and the sisters to stand up over there. And to I see any the people coming closer and hugging each other and expressing the love between one another because the Prophet ﷺ, one man came to him and told him, you know, O oh Messenger of Allah, can you see this man over there? Yes, I love him. He say, I love him. The Prophet ﷺ told him what? Go and tell him that. Why are you telling me? If I love Brother Ilyas, why will I go to Brother Abdullah over there and tell him, you know, Ilyas, I love him? Why don't you just go to Ilyas? Ilyas, I love you. So I wanted to see that. The Prophet ﷺ taught us that dua, yeah? I love you for the sake of Allah. And the person who listened to this should respond, May the one whom you loved me for his sake love you also. Let us revive this sunnah in this place before I go, inshallah, okay? But brothers, don't act smart, don't go to the sister. I love you, sister. For... Don't be smart, yeah? Sisters to sisters, brothers to brothers. We love our sisters, but expressing it uh, may lead to some issues. Uh, last part, last part, very important, very important. One of the most, most, most important pillar for any Muslim, after the five pillars, of course, essential manner, which is most challenging, most difficult also. So it's most important, yet difficult. Istiqama. To remain consistent upon the straight path. And what can make us mustaqim? What can make us really reach to that level of istiqama By cutting out the haram from our lives. If you don't cut the haram from your life, you will remain like a Muslim who is yo-yo. Yo-yo Muslim. You know yo-yo Muslim? Friday Muslims, Ramadani Muslims, Taraweeh Muslims. Those Muslims who appear in occasions, like fruits. They appear in seasons, you know? No, no, no. Muslims are... You know, fruitful tree all the time, all the season. 24-7, you must be a Muslim. Istiqama, one of the most challenging. That's why the man who came to the Prophet ﷺ, he told him, Oh Messenger of Allah, teach me something that I should hold fast unto it. He said, it, uh, قُلْ رَبِّيَ اللَّهِ ثُمَّ اسْتَقِمْ Say, say, declare, my Lord is Allah, and then remain steadfast upon that. After you say, Allah is my Lord, Remain firm upon that belief. Don't go back and forth, back and forth. I'm a Muslim, yes, but hijab is not my type. I'm a Muslim, but Friday is fine for me. I'm a Muslim, but movies is good. 
I'm a Muslim, but music is taking all of my time. We are Muslims. And I, I always made this as a point for you to remember. Anytime you take an action in your life, any action, even you're going to the kitchen cooking, or you're going to the work, or you're using your computer at night, midnight, remember this. If the Prophet ﷺ is next to you, will he approve of that action or no? Ask yourself this question. Wallahi, if, if, if you have to, print it out. Type it, print it out and put it in every room so that you remember that the Prophet ﷺ wouldn't ever approve these haram elements that have entered our homes, media, movies, destructive movies that teach our children, you know, bad behaviors and sexual images and so on and so forth. How could you say Allahu Akbar and stand before Allah and remember the movie and remember the kissing and remember the hugs and how could you focus in Salah? How? And these images, the human cameras store the image for life. Right? These human cameras, once you look at an, at an, uh, an image, it will store there forever. You will keep remembering it, right? You can go now in time 20 years back and you can still remember one scene between you and your mom, between you and your dad. That's why the Prophet ﷺ said, lower your gaze. When something comes distracting you, lower your gaze. Stay away from that which is haram. If you want to be always steadfast, consistent, cut out any haram element from your life. Look, even the Prophet ﷺ was ordered, was commanded, فَاسْتَقِمْ كَمَا أُمِرْتْ O Muhammad, be steadfast as you have been commanded. It's a command to be mustaqim. The scholar said, Allah will determine your destiny, whether Jannah or hell, by your level of istiqamah. How consistent you are. Allah will, de will determine your destiny, whether Jannah or hell. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala save us all. When this ayah, when this surah was revealed, the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said what? Shayyabatni hud. The chapter of Hud made my hair go gray. Because of the heaviness of the message. How much more all these messages? How, how, much, how much feelings do you have in your heart now to leave this hole with really intention to act upon the knowledge? Because there is a difference, as I said, between knowing and doing. Knowing and doing. The last story here with me, inshallah, before we end this uh, session inshallah is the story of the man that I mentioned in the straight path how many of you have attended the straight path raise up your hand mashallah 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 okay you know I believe in repetition and I love repetition yeah so I'm gonna repeat the story of the man that I told you that in the day of judgment inshallah in Jannah we're gonna kiss his forehead who is that man Abdullah ibn Hudhafa al-Sahmi those who didn't hear his name before please write it down write it down Abdullah ibn Hudhafa al-Sahmi, a man who was sent with an army to fight with, you know, the Christian nation back then during the time of Umar ibn Khattab. And they were caught as prisoners of war, over 300. And they were interested to bring Abdullah ibn Hudhafa al-Sahmi into Christianity. They wanted to convert him to Christianity. So the king told him what? Embrace Christianity and I'm going to give you half of my wealth. He said, by Allah, if you give me all your wealth and the wealth of the entire planet, I will never leave the deen of Muhammad for a blinking of an eye. Tough. This is toughness. Yeah. Toughness of faith. They put him in the cell. They prevented him from food and drinks for three days. They give him pork and wine after that. He didn't touch them. He said, I will never allow you to say that a Muslim have touched the haram. This is how they care. They send after him a prostitute to seduce him, to break him because they knew, they knew that in zina, billah, faith is snatched away from the person. He ran away from her. He ran away until the lady went out and she said, he is a rock. This is not, this is not normal. They hang him on a tree. They shoot, they shot arrows towards his direction. They didn't hit him. They brought two of his companions and they threw them in a boiling oil. And Abdullah ibn Hudhaf al-Sahmi, he said that I saw the bones of my friends floating on the surface of the oil. They were separated from his body. 
These companions sacrificed their lives for you, for you and I, so that we can come today and say, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah, wa ashhadu anna Muhammad Rasulullah, freely, freely, without torture, without punishment from other people. May Allah keep this country safe. Ameen, ya Rabb. And then he cried, radiallahu anhu arda, he cried, he wept. Then they thought, ah, oh, he became weak now, let's bring him back to the king. And the king told him, are you ready now to become a Christian? He's saying, no. He says, so why did you cry? He said, I cried because I remember that I've got only one soul. If you killed me now, that's it. I'm gone. So I wish to have a hundred souls so that you can kill me a hundred times. And every time I will die for the sake of Allah. Abdullah ibn Hudhaf al-Sahmi. The king gave up on him. He told him, okay, kiss my head and I will let you go free. He said, no. Kiss my head and I will let you go free and with you 60 of the prisoners. He said, no. One of the most stubborn companions, mashallah. Kiss my head, please. And he started begging him now. And I will let you go free and with you how many? 300. The whole lot. He said, okay. He went up and he kissed his forehead. And he freed them. And he gave them even 60 concubines, you know, as gift maids with him. Okay, go. And on the way, some people talked about Abdullah ibn Hudhaf al-Sahmi. They didn't like the fact that he kissed the Christian king's forehead. They didn't like it. Who heard it? Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu arda, the just man. He said, Wallahi, listen, listen to, Wallahi, it is a duty upon every Muslim to kiss the forehead of Abdullah ibn Hudhaf al-Sahmi and I am going to do it first. And he went up and he kissed his forehead. That's why one of my dreams, one of my hopes, inshallah in Jannah, after I meet the Prophet Sallallahu and drink from his hand, Ameen, say Ameen. There's no energy, guys. What's wrong with you? <laughs> after that, I wanted to rush and have a look at Abdullah ibn Hudhaf al-Sahmi and kiss his forehead, inshallah, and all of us, inshallah. My brothers and sisters in Islam, Allah knows our nature. Allah knows that we are weak. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows that we are struggling to be better. So I don't want you to feel bad if you are still infected with lying, if you are still infected with hatred, if you are not yet on the, you know, consistent. Don't give up. Just do your best. Learn the reward. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, إِنَّ الَّذِينَ قَالُوا رَبُّنَ اللَّهُ ثُمَّ اسْتَقَامُوا تَتَنَزَّلُ عَلَيْهِمُ الْمَلَائِكَةِ أَلَّا تَخَافُوا وَلَا تَحْزَنُوا وَأَبْشِرُوا بِالْجَنَّةِ الَّتِي كُنْتُمْ تُعَدُونَ As of those who said our Lord is Allah and then remain steadfast, the angels will descend upon them at the moment of death telling them, don't worry, don't scare, don't be sad and receive the good news of Jannah. Finally, at the moment of death, you will know that this is Jannah. Allahu Akbar. We are your supporters in this world and in the next. And when you get there, you will have whatever you wish for and whatever you ask for. Allah wanted to motivate you, my brothers and sisters, but don't leave this hole without making a decision. That inshallah, we are going to complete our deen. We are going to build up Islam. Not just with the five pillars, not just by coming, attending a lecture every week and doing nothing after that. In fact, every lecture you attend, make notes, and during that week, from this Sunday, for example, to the next, I'm practicing what I have learned in that lecture. And if you do that every week, your knowledge will grow and you will be completing your deen. You will be building up Islam. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us. My brother and sister, don't give hope. Allah subhanahu, don't give up hope. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in the Quran, قُلْ يَا عِبَادِيَ الَّذِينَ أَسْرَفُوا عَلَىٰ أَنفُسِهِمْ لَا تَقْنَتُوا مِنْ رَحْمَةِ اللَّهِ Tell my servants, O oh Muhammad, those who transgressed against themselves, who sinned day and night, tell them, despair not from the mercy of Allah, for Allah forgive all sins. Indeed, He is the most forgiving, the most merciful. Jazakumullah khairan. May Allah bless you for your patience. I know it's a bit late, and I was hoping Shaykh Hussein now will come if you have questions, so that we can entertain your questions, inshallah. Jazakumullah khairan. سبحانك اللهم وبحمدك نشهد أن لا إله إلا أنت نستغفرك ونتوب إليك جزاكم الله خيرا والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته شكرا
Mm-hmm.